Hey everyone, welcome to your sixth DNA message tutorial. Today we're going to be going over the guiding principles that are in the annotation guide as of 2015. So I will leave the uh, download link to that guide in the description as well. I recommend uh, reading these as we go along, or you can just watch the video here. So these are just pretty much a set of principles guiding um, your basic bacteriophage annotation. So these are going to be just the basic things that you need to know before beginning your annotation. They're very useful to know um, and they'll help you um, just kind of go through your annotation. So you may want to take a couple of minutes just to learn these and try to keep them in mind while you're doing your annotation. So I'll just go through them very quickly and maybe explain some that I um, deem necessary. Number one, in any segment of DNA, typically only one frame and one strand is used for protein coding gene. That is, each double-stranded segment of DNA is generally part of only one gene. Um, I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Number two is pretty interesting. Genes do not often overlap by more than a few base pairs, although up to about 30 base pairs is legitimate. So bacteriophage genomes are very small, they're very compact, so there sometimes is a lot of overlap and there's very little space in between the genes sometimes. Um, so you'll, you won't find too many spaces in between genes and you won't find too big of overlaps, but there is some overlap. So um, if you're annotating your phage genome, it's, it's very normal to see you know, a three base pair overlap or a six base pair overlap, etc. Um, so if the genes overlap, don't don't get scared, don't worry about that. Like it, like it says here, up to 30 base pairs is legitimate. Number three, the gene density in phage genomes is very high, so genes tend to be tightly packed. Thus, there are typically not large non-coding gaps between genes. So just as I mentioned before, everything's kind of packed together. There's not huge gaps in between. So um, you know, maybe if you're looking for the start site of a gene and you have a huge gap, you may want to uh, find a start site that's closer to the end of the previous gene or something like that. So just, just something to keep in mind. Number four, protein coding genes should have coding potential predicted by Glimmer, GeneMark, or GeneMark SMEG. Start sites are chosen to include all coding potential. These are by far the strongest pieces of data for predicting genes. We shouldn't have to worry about that one too much because if you did the auto annotation process and everything like that, the start sites are automatically generated for you using these three tools. I think this is just referring to, um, you know, if you're using an outside resource to, to maybe override uh, where you should start a start site or you're thinking just based on gaps and and overlaps, um, changing the start site. and that is is a bad idea if it's not predicted by Glimmer GeneMark or GeneMark SMEG. As it says here, these are by far the strongest pieces of de data for predicting genes. Moving on to number five, if there are two genes transcribed in opposite directions whose start sites are near one another, there typically has to be a space between them for transcription promoters in both directions. This usually requires at least a 50 base pair gap. So. Uh, let's see if we can find an example here. We're going to open this up. Okay, so this is what it's referring to if you direct your attention to gene 32 and 33. So 32 is in the forward direction, that's why it's green, and the uh, 33 is in the reverse direction, so that's why it's red. But these two are next to each other. Um, what it's saying is that there usually has to be a bigger gap. Um, it says upwards of 50 base pairs to allow for the transcription promoters in both directions. So if we see here, uh, gene 32 ends at 28,686 and the um, 33 picks up at 28,740 so that's a 64 base pair gap so that would be sufficient that would be good um, and we can credit these start sites um, at least based on that information now sometimes you'll randomly find a, a, a reverse gene in amongst a lot of forward genes like you'll just find one random reverse gene say um, up in this area there there isn't an example here but let's just say that a reverse gene was found up here it had a big overlap between forward genes and you know it it just was all by itself the only reverse gene in that area usually that happens at least once um, per genome at least in my experiences and sometimes those have to be um, actually most of the time they end up being uh, not real genes and they end up being uh, deleted or removed Usually when you see a reverse gene or a forward gene, they're always kind of clumped together. So you'll see this five reverse genes. These are grouped together, so they're perfectly legitimate looking. Um, but if you find you know, a random reverse gene uh, by itself in amongst all forward genes or vice versa, a forward gene in amongst reverse genes, 
uh, usually that's a red flag to uh, take a look at that, but not always. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. Number six, protein coding genes are generally at least 120 base pairs or 40 codons long. There are a small number of accept exceptions. Genes below about 200 base pairs require careful examination. So I, I generally don't come across genes this small. Um, let's see, 21 here is 129 base pairs long. So that just cuts it um, where this one, where this uh, rule applies. So 120 base pairs. Uh, this seems to be the smallest gene in this genome, 129. Let's see if there's anything smaller. Don't, I don't see anything. Uh, yeah, that, that, that seems to be the small, oh, I saw 108. Um, so yeah, we would have to take a closer look at gene 61, these in, in this area here to see if they're really a couple of genes. See this little clump of five genes here. We'll have to take a closer look at those to see if they're really separate genes or if they are um, maybe just one gene, uh, maybe 61 and 62 is just one gene. So we'll have to take a closer look at that. But that's just something to keep in mind. A normal length of a gene is upwards of probably 200 base pairs. But as it mentions, take a closer look at the smaller ones, especially less than 200. And if you're below 120, definitely um, you'll need to further investigate that and decide um, based on the other evidence. Number seven, switches in gene orientation from forward to reverse or vice versa are relatively rare. In other words, it is common to find groups of genes transcribed in the same direction. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you usually find uh, these genes grouped together. You rarely find a legitimate gene that's um, by itself a reverse gene in amongst the forward genes and vice versa. So that's just something else to look out for. Number eight, each protein coding gene had ends with a stop codon TAG, TGA, or TAA. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Number nine, each protein coding gene starts with initiation codon ATG, D GTG, or TTG. But note that TTG is used rarely. About 7% of genes ATG and GTG are used at almost equivalent frequency. So if you are a student and you learned maybe in general bio or in other classes that ATG is the only stops or only start site or start codon, that is wrong. That's um, not accurate. I mean, at least as far as bacteria and bacteriophages, there are some instances where GTG and TTG are start sites and you have to look out for those and keep those in mind as well. So TTG, like it says here, is pretty rare. Uh, about 7% of all genes and ATG and GTG will be the others. So number 10 talks about choosing uh, the correct start site or more specifically the start codon. So ultimately it just is telling you a couple key things to keep in mind when maybe considering changing your start site. Um, so uh, A here states the relationship to the closest upstream gene is important. Usually there is neither a large gap nor a large overlap nothing more than seven base pairs. And like I said, it's very common to find a three base pair gap, a three base pair overlap. Usually there is neither a large gap nor a large overlap. So like I said earlier, it's pretty normal to see a three base pair gap and a three base pair overlap, or maybe a six base pair uh, gap or overlap. Those are just some things uh, to look out for as well. B, the position of the start site is often conserved amongst homologs of genes. So this comes down to blasting on phages DB and blasting on um, blast P and, do, and doing the different um, outside bioinformatics things that you will find. Uh, that's where you'll find the homolog phages of your, or the homolog versions of your genes in other phages. So if you see in your search results that there are 10 phages that have been QC annotated and they're already finished and they're up on um, NCBI Blast. And let's say you're looking for gene 27. You see that all 10 of these uh, phage genomes have gene 27 and the start site is, let's say, uh, at 15,000 and the, the start site is ATG. More than likely, um, if all 10 of those things have gone through the QC process, and they all have the same start start site and everything like that. Mo more than likely, actually, 
extremely likely um, the start site will be the same as those um, homolog genes. So it's definitely extremely helpful to look at previously QC annotated phage genomes, especially in phages DB when choosing a start site or when considering to change a start site. Look at the homologs of that gene. And again, it mentions using Starterator. We'll get to that later. C, the preferred start site usually has a favorable RB RBS score within all potential start codons, but not necessarily the best. So I think I showed you guys that before. If I didn't, we'll definitely cover it soon again in an upcoming episode, but they usually have a good score, but as it says here, not necessarily the best. So you shouldn't really be um, expecting your start site to have like the worst or one of the worst scores except for this exception here with the integrase. D, manual inspection can be helpful to distinguish between possible start sites. And E, your final start site selection will likely represent a compromise of these sub principles. So you will have to keep all of these into account. Choosing the start site is one of the most important things of the phage annotation process. It is probably the most critical part uh, in terms of thinking. You just have to, you spend a lot of time doing this um, out of the whole annotation process. This is really where you wanna sit down and think about things and um, really decide where the start sites are for each and every one of your genes. And the last guiding principle here, 11, tRNA genes are not called precisely in the program in DNA Master and require extra attention. We'll get to that later. Uh, pretty much you have to use a couple outside websites and resources. So these are the guiding principles. I will copy and paste these in the description as well as a download link to the annotation guide. If you guys wish to download this yourself, I would definitely recommend that. But these are just the basics before we get into the annotation process. I hope you guys enjoyed and I hope you learned something. As always, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And I will see you guys in the next episode.